Good day, everyone, and welcome to the very first quarter 2021 earnings results conference call. This call is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After today's prepared remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session where we will limit participants to one question and one follow-up. We will have further instructions for you at that time. For opening remarks and introductions, I would like to turn the call over to Varys, Head of Investor Relations, Ms. Stacey Bader. Ms. Bader, please go ahead. Thank you, Myra, and good day, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today for a discussion of our first quarter 2021 financial results. Today's call will be led by Scott Stevenson, Varys Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, who will provide an overview of our business. Lee Shabel, Chief Financial Officer and Group President, will follow with the financial review. Mark Anquilari, Chief Operating Officer and Group President, will join the team for the Q&A session. The earnings release referenced on this call, as well as the associated 10Q, can be found in the investor section of our website, Veris.com. The earnings release has also been attached to an 8K that we have furnished to the SEC. A replay of this call will be available for 30 days on our website and by dial-in. Finally, as set forth in more detail in today's earnings release, I will remind everyone that today's call may include forward-looking statements about their future performance, including, but not limited to, the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Actual performance could differ materially from what is suggested by our comments today. Information about the factors that could affect future performance is contained in our recent SEC filings. And now I will turn the call over to Scott. Thanks, Stacey. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first quarter 2021 earnings conference call. 2021 is a special year here at Verisk as it marks our 50th anniversary as a company. For 50 years, our mission and purpose has been the same. We work nonstop in partnership with our customers using data and insights to make a difference by helping protect people, economies, society, and our planet. On this journey, we have used our unique data and combined it with advanced technologies in new ways to unlock meaningful insights about risk, becoming a global leader in cutting-edge analytics. And while we are very proud of our accomplishments over the last 50 years, it inspires us to look ahead to all the difference we can make over the next 50 years. I'm pleased to share that this year is off to a solid start marked by continued growth in our subscription businesses. We delivered solid growth in insurance, a modest sequential improvement in our energy segment, yet we had a challenging quarter within financial services. While certain of our businesses continue to be impacted by the pandemic, those revenue streams show resilience as the underlying causal factors improve, and we have confidence in this relationship. We will provide more detail in his financial review. For 2021, we remain focused on building long-term shareholder value delivering for our customers through innovation and service while also protecting the health and well-being of our teammates around the globe. Currently, most of our offices are operating in a phase one format and are available for those employees who have volunteered to work from the office. We do have certain offices that have advanced to phase two and even phase three as conditions in their local markets allow, and employees are energized to be back in the office. Our Global Protection Services team closely monitors directives from local governments and public health officials around the world, as well as incorporates learnings from our local market experiences to make real-time decisions to maintain the safety of our people. To that end, our teams are closely monitoring the current situation in India in the face of a severe second wave of COVID, and we are providing relief and assistance to our India colleagues, including vaccination coverage, virtual medical services, emergency relief funds, and other essential programs. To date, we have experienced minimal or no disruption to our business or the services we provide. Over the duration of the pandemic, our teams have proven they can transition efficiently into different work modes with minimal interruption in service to our customers. So while there remains some uncertainty around return to office timing across our many different markets, I have complete confidence that our 9,000 plus teammates at Veris will continue to navigate through these times effectively and deliver the highest value to our customers. Throughout the pandemic, I've maintained a high level of engagement with our customers and CEOs across all three of our segments. Despite the virtual setting, the frequency of these meetings has increased 
and the level of engagement and mutual respect has deepened. In these conversations, we are discussing our customers' highest strategic priorities. In all circumstances, we are receiving feedback that Verisk is a trusted and differentiated partner and that our solutions and innovations play a large and increasing role in our customers' journeys to becoming more digitally engaged, more automated, and more efficient. These types of constructive meetings are happening across all levels of our organization. Most recently, within our underwriting and claims councils, which include representatives from our top 25 customers in the insurance vertical. With regard to digital engagement, we continue to see very strong adoption of our virtual claims processing platform, Claims Experience, as insurers continue to find additional use cases for remote claims handling outside the pandemic. Our virtual claims tools enable our customers to conduct business at a time when in-person processes were not possible. But it also has the added benefit of settling claims with greater speed. In fact, virtual claims are paid on average 30% faster than the traditional process. We've recently added new features to enhance the solution, including remote measurement, object recognition, and an automated damage assessment tool. We also are having success converting customers from transactional usage to long-term contracts with committed volumes as they build comfort with the tool and realize the value that remote claims processing can bring to their organization. One of the strongest signals of the deep and expanding relationships with their customers, in our view, is the fact that they entrust us with their data. I'm pleased to share that in the most recent year, 29 insurers have decided to newly contribute data to our ISO statistical database. This is the highest number of new participants in a single year over the last 10 years and represents a range of different customers from insure startups to multi-state carriers. On the sales front, we're having great success selling in virtual mode and remain committed to advancing our techniques with ongoing training across the many new virtual selling tools we employ. Our pipelines of new opportunities are some of the strongest in our history, and they continue to build. Our customers are more engaged with Verisk as a partner, as evidenced by increased numbers of meetings, better attendance at our virtual conferences, and contract renewals and signings of new deals that are longer in duration. On the innovation front, we continue to make advances with our solutions to drive digital engagement, automate processes, and create a seamless interconnected ecosystem, what we at Veris refer to as platforms analytic environments. While this is a journey we've been on for some time, the pandemic has catalyzed our customers to move forward with greater urgency and speed. These platforms and analytic environments offer our customers deep integration into their workflows and allow a massive amount of information to be rendered so that decisions can be made quickly and accurately. Often, these environments are more software intensive as we are utilizing this software to gather more data, automate more processes, and become even more deeply embedded with our customers. These platforms are also driving healthy and profitable growth for Veris across our verticals. Let me give you a few recent examples. Within life insurance, we are driving strong growth and profitability as we bundle the industry-leading module software offerings at FAST with the data analytics we have developed across Veris to create a full suite of life insurance solutions in one singular platform. We're having great success extending and accelerating the adoption of FAST solutions across our broad customer base and have a strong pipeline of future deals. In addition, we recently launched new analytics, including EHR triage engine and life risk navigator. Electronic health record triage engine uses advanced data analytics and natural language processing to distill thousands of pages of electronic medical records into a short summary and provides an automated underwriting score, both of which reduce underwriting costs and speed up the process and that leads to an improved buying experience for the end consumer. LifeRisk Navigator is a cloud-based modeling platform that offers in-depth portfolio analytics to enhance risk selection, quantify changes in mortality rates, and drive overall better decision-making. Further, in March, we enhanced our capabilities in life insurance through the acquisition of 4C Solutions, a software advisory firm with expertise in group life insurance the addition of 4C enables us to extend our expertise into the group life market 
and help address the needs for group life insurers and institutional annuity providers. While each solution is strong on its own, we believe we deliver even more value for our customers as these solutions are integrated into one holistic, interconnected ecosystem. We are also delivering very strong growth at SQL as we help our customers in the specialty markets digitize and modernize. SQL solutions create a truly integrated ecosystem across carriers, brokers, and managing general agents throughout the specialty market, and we are bringing in new customers and expanding our suite of products across existing customers. We are also begin beginning to see traction in our global expansion of SQL with new clients signed in the U.S. and Asia Pacific. To further enhance the value and capability of the SQL eco ecosystem, we recently acquired a majority stake in white space software. The powerful combination of white space's digital placing platform with SQL's pricing distribution and policy administration applications enables a seamless, real-time, quote-to-bind solution with straight-through submissions for our existing and prospective customers. In our energy business, we continue to make advances on the development of new modules and sales of new subscriptions for our Lens platform. Despite the softness in the energy end market, customers are recognizing the value and uniqueness of the platform, and this is reflected in new customer subscriptions and constructive pricing for customers that adopt Lens. Additionally, we have lots of interest in future releases for Lens and already have a group of development partners in place to support Lens power. Backed by the proprietary data assets of Wood McKenzie and Genscape, Lens Power enables customers to maximize investment opportunities in clean energy and be on the forefront of the energy transition and further advances our market-leading position in the energy transition. We are well positioned to capitalize on the growing trend of countries and companies around the world, increasing investment toward renewables and green energy, and our solutions will help inform these critical decisions at the highest levels. Lens Power is part of a broader suite of solutions that we have within our energy segment to help our customers navigate the changing ESG landscape. We are seeing a positive market response to our energy customer solutions for improved management of supply chain risk and ESG priorities like emissions benchmarking and supplier diversity programs. Not only are we helping our customers with their ESG initiatives, we have also moved forward on our own ESG agenda. In early April, we released our annual CSR report, which you can find in the Corporate Social Responsibility section of our website. This year's report is notable for three reasons. First, the environmental section features our Climate Disclosure Report, which speaks to the four pillars of TCFD, governance, risk and opportunities, risk management, and metrics and targets. Our board and senior management team are very engaged on these subjects, uh, including climate change and climate transition, both on the risks we face, but equally important on the opportunities they present for our business. We've been helping customers understand, measure, and manage risk associated with climate and weather for decades, windstorms, wildfire, and flood risk, among others, and are building on a base of knowledge, data, predictive models, analytic expertise, industry-leading standards, and investments that are already in play and serving our insurance and energy customers daily. Second, we used the CSR report as the vehicle to deliver our first ever disclosure in accordance with SASB's recommendations for professional and commercial services companies. The disclosure includes baseline metrics around workforce composition, diversity, engagement, and turnover. We intend to update those metrics in our CSR report each year. And finally, the CSR report calls out Verisk's approach to cybersecurity, a comprehensive document that describes our commitment and investments to strengthen data security and privacy. That commitment doesn't just exist on paper, but is reinforced through the mandatory training we conduct annually for all of our employees. We're very proud of the progress we made throughout 2020. Our board and senior management team are very much engaged and our entire organization is committed to continue to move forward our ESG agenda over the coming years. I'm confident we have the right strategy and team in place to meet our long-term growth objectives. Our deep domain expertise and relationships with our customers help inform our innovation agenda. And we are treating the year 2021 as one that provides a unique set of signals 
on the resilience of the different parts of our company, which we are pulling into our always active capital process to ensure that our capital is deployed into the highest return opportunities. Now I'll turn the call over to Lee to cover our financial results. Thank you, Scott. First, I would like to bring to everyone's attention that we have posted a quarterly earnings presentation that is available on our website. Additionally, you may notice that we have a slightly new presentation of our financial statements. As Scott mentioned earlier, during the quarter, we closed on a majority investment in white space software. As a result, we now report net income and earnings per share attributable to their risk. Moving to the financial results for the first quarter, on a consolidated and gap basis, revenue grew 5.3% to $726 million. Net income attributable to Veris decreased 1.8% to $169 million, while diluted gap earnings per share attributable to Veris declined 1% to $1.03, reflecting a $19 million gain on dispositions in the prior year that did not reoccur. Moving to our organic constant currency results, adjusted for non-operating items as defined in the non-gap financial measures section of our press release, we are very pleased with our operating results, considering the continued impact from COVID-19. In the first quarter, organic constant currency revenue grew 3.4%, led by continued strength in our insurance segment and modest sequential improvement in our energy segment. This quarter's performance fundamentally reflected a year-over-year -year comparison to a largely pre-pandemic quarter, although we began to see progress in our COVID-sensitive revenues, which improved sequentially. Our non-COVID-sensitive revenues, as we defined at the start of the pandemic, grew approximately 4.9% on an organic constant currency basis, down from 6.5% rate in the fourth quarter, reflecting a lower level of catastrophe bond securitization activity at AIR and a higher level of impact from consolidation in the insurance and energy segments. We did continue to experience, as we have since the onset of the pandemic, a negative impact from COVID-19 on certain of our products and services, largely transactional in nature, which represent the balance or approximately 15% of our revenues. However, we saw an improvement as certain of these products and services returned to growth on a year-over-year -year basis. COVID-sensitive revenues declined approximately 5.9% on an organic constant currency basis during the first quarter, compared to the 12.5% decline in the fourth quarter, primarily as the result of improved consulting activity in our energy sector, but also reflecting a return to growth of several products and services, particularly in the U.S. Despite the impact on revenue in the first quarter, we are pleased to report that we delivered solid EBITDA growth and expanded margins as a result of effective expense management and lower travel expenses. Organic constant currency adjusted EBITDA growth was 5.2% in the first quarter, up from 4.9% growth in the fourth quarter. Total adjusted EBITDA margin for the quarter, which includes both organic and inorganic revenue, and adjusted EBITDA was 47.6% in the quarter, representing leverage across our insurance and energy verticals, offset in part by weakness in financial services. This margin level includes roughly 150 basis points of benefit from lower travel expenses, but also reflects a return to a more normal pace of headcount growth and an increase in the pace of investment in our technological transformation, including our cloud transition costs. On that note, let's turn to our segment results on an organic constant currency basis. In the first quarter, insurance segment revenues increased 6%, reflecting healthy growth in our industry standard insurance programs, catastrophe modeling solutions, repair cost estimating solutions, and insurance software solutions we experienced a modest benefit from storm-related revenues as a result of the ice storms in Texas and the Southeast. However, this was more than offset by a lower level of securitization revenues in our catastrophe modeling business as issuance was lower year over year. In addition, we experienced declines in certain transactional revenues that were negatively impacted by COVID-19 as we had very minimal COVID impact in the first quarter of 2020. Adjusted EBITDA grew 8.3% in the first quarter, while margins expanded 196 basis points, demonstrating strong margin expansion despite certain revenue declines, investment in our breakout areas, and increased costs associated with our cloud transition. Energy and specialized markets revenue decreased 0.6% in the first quarter due to declines in consulting and implementation projects and some modest headwinds related to consolidation in the end market. 
growth in core research and environmental health and safety service revenues was offset by declines in transactional and consulting revenues. We attribute our performance to the diversification of our revenue streams into higher growth breakout areas like the energy transition and chemicals, the broad range of end markets that we serve, and the strength of our relationships in the industry. Adjusted EBITDA grew 6.6% in the first quarter, while margins expanded 237 basis points, reflecting continued cost discipline and the benefit of lower travel expenses. As a key partner to our energy customers, we are deeply engaged with them and part of their most strategic and important decisions. We have a track record of managing through volatile times effectively and believe we are well positioned with our energy transition solutions as well as our lens platform to continue to outperform the end market and help our customers navigate this broad energy transition. Financial services revenue declined 12.8% in the quarter, reflecting the continued impact of contract transitions that we undertook in 2020 and which will continue for the next two quarters, as well as lower levels of project spending from our bank customers stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and fewer bankruptcies as a result of government support and forbearance programs. Adjusted EBITDA declined 74%, reflecting the negative impact of lower sales and a larger impact of corporate expense allocations on the segment's smaller base. We continue to make progress on our journey to transition Ferris Financial Services to a more sustainable subscription-based business. We are achieving the goals we have set for the business and have taken actions that we believe benefit the business in the long run, but are likely to continue to negatively impact our growth over the next few quarters. To that end, given the continued impacts from COVID-19 and the contract transitions, we expect to see a similar level of revenue and profit performance in the second quarter of 2021. However, as the impact of the contract transitions abate and our COVID-sensitive revenues improve, we anticipate a stronger back half of the year performance. Our reported effective tax rate was 22.5% compared to 20.8% in the prior year quarter, mostly owing to lower stock option exercises in the current period. As we have discussed, there will likely continue to be some quarterly variability related to the impact of employee stock option exercises, which depends in part on the various stock price and employee personal decisions. As a result of a tax law change in the UK, we now believe that our full year tax rate for 2021 will be between 23 and 25 percent, up from the 20 to 22 percent we had previously provided. This UK legislation was passed in March and will increase the UK corporate tax rate to 25% from 19% previously. This UK tax rate increase is likely to create variability in our quarterly rates as we expect we will be subject to a one-time non-cash revaluation charge in the third quarter related to a deferred tax liability when the bill is expected to become law. Our best estimate at this time is that our quarterly rate in the third quarter will be in the range of 33 to 35% but we expect this to be primarily one-time in nature and do not anticipate a material long-term impact from this increase. Adjusted net income was $203 million and diluted adjusted EPS was $1.23 for the first quarter of 2021, up 4.6% and 5.1% from the prior year, respectively. These increases reflect solid top-line growth, cost discipline in the business, a reduction in travel expenses as a result of COVID-19, and a lower average share count. This was offset in part by a higher effective tax rate. Net cash provided by operating activities was $449 million for the quarter, up 24% from the prior year period, primarily due to increased customer collections and a reduction in travel payments as a result of COVID-19. Capital expenditures were $59 million for the quarter, up 12%. We continue to believe that CapEx will be in the range of $250 to $280 million, reflecting our continued investment in our innovation agenda our technological transformation, as well as the carryover of certain expenditures that were delayed in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. Related to capital expenditure, we expect fixed asset depreciation and amortization will be within the range of 200 to 215 million. However, we now forecast intangible amortization to be approximately 180 million, reflecting the impact of recent acquisitions and changes in foreign currency rates. Both depreciation and amortization elements are subject to foreign exchange variability, the timing of purchases and the completion of projects and future M&A activity. 
During the first quarter, we returned $147 million in capital to shareholders through share repurchases and dividends. In addition, in May, we repaid our 5.8% senior notes in the amount of $450 million through a combination of cash from operations and proceeds from our credit facility. Our strategy to deliver long-term sustainable growth remains unchanged, and we believe the stability and predictability of our subscription revenues will persist. As we approach the anniversary of the onset of the pandemic, we plan to continue to provide updates on our non-COVID and COVID-sensitive revenues to offer transparency on the recovery of our business. We remain confident the COVID impacts do not represent a structural change in our fundamental growth drivers and believe that as the underlying causal factors abate with the rollout of vaccinations and the opening of global economies, we will show strong resilience and recovery. We also have confidence in our ability to manage the cost structure effectively to protect profitability, though we would remind you that cost comparisons will be more challenging beginning in the second quarter. Taking this all together, we believe that as the COVID impacts abate, we can return to our long-term growth model of 7% organic constant currency revenue growth with core operating leverage, allowing EBITDA to grow faster than revenue, although it's difficult to predict that timing. We hope this provides some useful context for you, and we look forward to addressing your questions. We continue to appreciate all the support and interest in Barris. Given the large number of analysts we have covering us, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll ask the operator to open the line for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question via the audio, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your request, you may press the pound or hash key. We have our first question comes from the line of Tony Catlin from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, I was hoping, Scott, that you could give us an update on the renewables business. I know you touched on it in the prepared remarks, but I guess how big is it now? What are the fastest growing areas within it? And what, what's proprietary within the renewables and energy transition? Thanks. Right. So it, what we do in the renewables area, Tony, is uh, across a very uh, broad front. Um, so it is um, uh, uh, everything from uh, solar to wind to biomass. Um, what differentiates us is um, a couple of things. One is we believe that we actually have uh, unique data about really the, uh, the uh, supply side of those industries. In addition to that, we're able to relate the developments in that part of the energy ecosystem to the rest of the energy ecosystem. And, and that's really critical because um, that is what uh, all the players in the, in the energy space want to do, including the traditional uh, hydrocarbon-based um, uh, players. They are, they are all very, very interested in how they modify who they are uh, in order to move into this future. Um, and then on top of all of that, we believe that we have the best platform analytic environment going uh, in Lens, which, which uh, permits us to put uh, all of this wonderful content into our customers' decision and workflows in a really easy to consume and, and uh, we believe differentiated way. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Manav Patnaik from Barclays. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you know, as things, uh, you know, are opening up here and you guys get a little bit more visibility, just longer term, I guess I wanted to just understand, you know, how you guys think about that 7% growth target for your entire company. I was just curious, like, if, if, if anything has changed, if you need to kind of revisit that, uh, that target. Yeah, nothing has changed in our perspective on that, uh, Mana. One of the things that, and I, and I sort of referenced this in my comments up front, but we are watching very carefully the results we're producing in 2021, both the what we deem the COVID-sensitive revenues, but also the non-COVID-sensitive uh, revenues, and those would relate more to the uh, subscription products that, that we have. And, and actually, we see good good progress in the performance of those, and actually they really have been the, the most steady part of our performance over the last several quarters. Um, and um, uh, 
we, we also reference our pipelines, both uh, renewals as well as uh, uh, new product, new, new sales opportunities. Um, and as I mentioned in, in my comments up front, we have some of the strongest pipelines we've ever had. And our focus is, is so very definitely on uh, subscription-based um, solutions. So the context for my answer to your question is that's where we're focused. Those are in good shape. They have been in good shape through the pandemic, and we think that um, uh, they will they will remain on on that track going forward. And, and Mon, if it's Lee, if I could just add um, to that, one thing that I, I think gave us um, confidence on the resilience of the of the growth rates was the, was the the overall performance of our non-COVID sensitive revenues through this period that, that we maintained um, stability stability there. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases. Given uh, some of the the value of our of our data and workflow um, oriented products in this more remote environment, uh, in some ways I think as we come out of this, it has accelerated some opportunities for us for the deployment of our of our data and analytics into into these new environments. Okay, understood. And then just on the you know the breakout area investment, uh, you know Lee, I think you've talked about kind of the ROIC and metrics and so forth before, but I was just curious from a you know, what time parameters do you put when you even make those decisions? Like, you know, how, how much of a, you know, long-term investment or, you know, do you have certain criteria that it has to, you know, return within a couple of years, et cetera? I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Lee, that's kind of into our work, our work papers on how we look at the many investment opportunities we've got. So maybe you want to yeah. talk to that. Um, Amana, thanks for the question. And I, I think as you can appreciate that we, when we look at that investment portfolio, we, we think of it in that regard where we have um, a, a wide range of products with different time horizons um, and different levels of, um, uh, of kind of risk associated with them, some earlier stage um, business opportunities, some later stage. We do try to manage those naturally um, in the con uh, overall to deliver um, return clearly in excess of our cost of capital um, and uh, and for higher risk um, smaller projects at a level well above that at some premium reflecting that higher risk um, and I would say that on average this of course is going to vary from project to project but we're generally looking to achieve those types of returns um, on a three to four year time frame in order to get to an acceptable return with upside um, beyond that. You know, that's the, the general parameters of the portfolio. And I think we also want to make it clear that that is not just internal investment but our external investment in M&A. We are evaluating the utilization of capital against both of those investment opportunities. Um, you know, certainly on the internal investment, you know, the opportunities to leverage our existing assets and our position and in infrastructure um, are, are substantially um, enable us to deliver um, higher returns, um, we expect, um, but on lower investments. On the M&A front, um, they are larger investments from a scale standpoint, but we are clearly focusing on how we are adding value to those. And the success that we've had uh, with the life, um, the fast acquisition, with the Genscape acquisition, um, with the acquisition in our um, in our 3E area, are all um, evidence of uh, our ability to deliver value either through reduced costs or improved functionality of those businesses. So hopefully that gives you some context in in how we look at both the internal and the external investment and some of the benchmarks that we use. Okay, thank you. We have our next question comes from the line of David Taggart from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Bridging to Manav's question, what are your current capital allocation priorities among acquisitions and share repurchase when you evaluate those two at, at current prices and valuations, and then uh, third would be uh, dividend growth. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you added that last bit, David, um, because um, uh, we have multiple forms for returning capital to shareholders. But even before that, I would really emphasize investment into the business to build these engines of growth. Um, you know, we you hear us talking all the time about platform to analytic environments. They are really the source of so many uh, forms of goodness uh, in terms of value for customers. And, and the result of them is that we have much stickier 
uh, relationships, which are which are just that much more recurrent. So I so if I was to prioritize our use of capital, I would actually start with um, internal investment, which is which is um, a, a, a genuine focal point. Um, we're very happy to return capital to shareholders. We have a long track record of doing that, and um, we feel very good about that. Um, and you know, with respect to M&A, we was already talking about kind of how we look at it. I mean, it's not as if we've earmarked some number of dollars or percentage of total capital available to go into M&A. It's more a question uh, with that third leg of whether or not the opportunity is compelling and meets our, our return hurdles. Um, and we are, we are definitely uh, emphasizing that which, in combination with what we, who we already are, the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. David, it's interesting um, that you, the um, and, and it's it's not uncommon for um, folks to make a comparison between um, share repurchases and and M and A. Uh, I will tell you that we think of it differently uh, in that um, we view M um, and A as more akin and evaluate it relative to our internal investment because both of them are our capital investments that we're making to generate return for shareholders, and both of those are subject to our return thresholds um, that we think are necessary to, to create value. And then if we are unable to find um, return opportunities in either of those, and I want to, uh, to emphasize you know, Scott's point, we think um, they're one of the strengths of Verist is the breadth and the depth of opportunity for us to invest internally in new products at very high incremental returns um, across a broad range uh, of, of client-driven opportunities in our industry sectors. But similarly, we see uh, uh, other opportunities on the M&A front. If we don't see um, uh, acceptable returns in either of those ventures, then we view share repurchases as with dividends um, an opportunity to return capital that we can't create value um, from in terms of higher in terms of higher returns. And then finally, with regard um, to um, dividends, um, the as you have seen, um, we have established a pattern of increasing that dividend that becomes that remains um, subject to um, the board's um, view on. Um, the dividend increase, um, but there is a, a recognition that companies that um, have demonstrated an ability to deliver consistent growth in the dividend um, over time um, are rewarded for that discipline. We believe that it has um, introduced a valuable additional component um, to our investor base um, as more yield-oriented investors um, that are looking for both growth and yield um, have been very additive to our, to our shareholder base. Um, and so we think that that is a useful additional component in our capital return strategy. Thanks very much. Appreciate it, Lee and Scott. You bet. We have our next question comes from the line of George Tong from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Financial services revenues are continuing to see the impact of contract transitions, which you noted will continue for the next two quarters. Is it possible to parse out how much impact is coming from contract transitions and how much is due to core reduced spending from banks and fewer bankruptcies? Um, yes, George, thanks for the, the question. Um, you know, we estimate that the impact of the contract transitions in the first quarter was approximately two-thirds of the, of the revenue decline that we saw on a year-over-year -year basis. And, and as you note, you know, this is uh, something that will cycle through. Um, we believe that those contract transitions, I would just remind folks, re um, represented in part um, a rebalancing of our relationship um, with, several of the, uh, with several of those contracts um, uh, shifting in our general strategy to move from less upfront revenues to more revenues extended over the relationship. So it reflects that there is um, some upside in future periods um, that, that balance that impact. Um, but the short answer is in the, in the quarter it was about two-thirds of the impact. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, um, we um, expect that, that impact to, be, um, to follow for the next two quarters. Got it. Very helpful. And just to follow up, uh, on the cost side, you mentioned that cost comparisons will be tougher in 2Q. How much in expenses do you expect to come back in the coming quarters? So, um, you, George, thanks for the, the question. I, I, I appreciate um, what, uh, what you're looking for. You know, I, I, it, it's um, – Hard to quantify. I, I guess I would I would approach it this way. One way to think of it is clearly we had um, a benefit um, from T and E um, of 
um, the reduction, the, the um, uh, elimination of travel. And we have described what the impact is from a margin standpoint of that, for instance, 150 basis points um, in, the, in this quarter. And we would um, expect that we would continue to see that benefit. Um, and, uh, and so we will see an increase um, in t and expenses, but I think that's going to be a, a gradual increase over time. The other element is going to be compensation um, and our incentive compensation in particular, where we're going to see a more normalized level. Um, as we saw in 2020, the responsiveness of our compensation, particularly incentive compensation, um, flex down. We are expecting a more normalized return, so we'll see some increase in, uh, in that. Plus, we are also uh, beginning to normalize headcount uh, as we see demand from the businesses um, to support their overall, their overall growth. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of factors, but as we, um, as we move through 2021, one way to think about it is in, is in reference to 2020. 2020, um, we saw the revenue um, impact, but we saw expenses decline um, more than the revenue impact, driving EBITDA growth of nearly 10% over that period. In 2021, I think we're going to see a recovery in revenue, but as we look at those comparisons, um, we will see um, higher expense growth. We still expect um, to be able to deliver EBITDA growth, um, but it will, um, it will be um, driven by the pace of expense growth, fortunately, which remains within our control. So our hope is that we will be able to manage um, that expense growth on the T&E, on the compensation front um, in terms of headcount growth um, in order to continue to deliver the growth, um, although um, not uh, naturally at the same level that we were able to achieve in 2020. Another way to think of it is that you know, we do um, expect that that, that, that dynamic um, while we, we'll, we'll drive you know, some reduction in margin, but we still are expecting to be able to retain, as we've said in the past, um, some, um, um, some meaningful level of the efficiencies that we achieved in 2020. I hope that gives you some, um, some direction towards your question, George. Yes, very helpful. Thank you, Lee. We have our next question. It comes from the line of Alex Kran from UBS. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yes, hey, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe just starting on the energy business. Uh, not sure if I missed it, but clearly uh, trends have gotten better. You sound pretty optimistic about energy transition and in, in, in pipelines here. Um, does that basically mean you think the business has bottomed, or are you still cautious uh, in terms of the next few quarters? Um, maybe the broader cyclical impact um, could still be negative. Yeah, you know, I'll just go back to something that we've said for a long period of time, which is for our, uh, our business in the energy sector in general to perform, we just need a normal environment. We don't need, we don't need a roaring commodity price. We just need a normal kind of environment. And our view is that that's more or less, you know, where the, where the, uh, the system has gotten to. And I would say, Alex, I, I think we're, um, we're encouraged by um, what we are experiencing um, both in the sales pipeline and in the consulting pipeline. We're also encouraged by um, the receptivity of our clients um, to the Lens platform as they are interacting with it and as they're using it. Um, they are, are clearly seeing the value that we are adding to um, the, the, the data and the research products that we've provided um, before. Um, so clearly there is a lot of risk uh, ahead as we um, manage through the pandemic, um, but we are, are seeing, we think, very constructive signs um, based upon the, the level of engagement we have so far. Okay, that's fair. And then secondarily, a little bit more holistic question, but, uh, you know, Lee, obviously um, the energy and the financials business started reporting to you, I think it's been now three months, not a long time, but, but, but three months nonetheless. And I think last quarter when asked about the business mix, Scott sounded a little bit more open to holistically review the, 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 the portfolio. So just wondering, Lee and, and maybe Scott too, as you've maybe dug deeper into those businesses, any early findings, any areas for improvement or any things where you're saying, hey, you know, this is maybe not as good of a fit uh, than we thought historically. Uh, so any updates will be helpful on that front. Thank you. Well, why, why don't I start? But you know, Lee, I, I think the question is kind of directed to you and your, you know, your oversight. But uh, you know, I'll just say that there is a playbook at Veris which, when it is in place, works very, very well. 
And that playbook is really centered on creating what we call platform analytic environments and analytic objects, which become industry standard analyzed output. And, and the more that we feature those in the mix of what we do in any part of Veris, the business becomes very uh, sticky, very resilient, grows well, represents a lot of value for customers. And I'll just say that, for, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick financial services in particular, the, the focus here at the moment is, first of all, to make sure that we capture all the, rev, all the COVID sensitive revenues as the, as the environment changes, make sure that we capture all those revenues you know, back into the mix, one, and two, um, is the continued uh, development of the platforms inside of Veris Financial that will represent that same kind of uh, Veris way, the Veris model, really, for, for doing business. And that's really what we're focused on in, in the near term, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're expectant about both of those things as it relates to the business. So that, you know, with respect to VFS in particular, Lee, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I do. Um, Alex, you know, thanks for the question. And, and I, would, I would say just uh, you know, briefly, you know, it is still early. I'm spending a lot of time with uh, both the, the financial services and the energy business and really drilling into to complement the kind of the top-down view from, um, from a financials, um, the bottoms-up focus on, on products, on clients, on people, um, to understand the underlying economics of the business. And um, you know, one, you know, I think, observation that it's, it's worth pointing out is that, uh, of course, you know, what's happening at those businesses um, is, is not wholly represented in what you see within the quarter. Um, we've talked about the contract transitions that, while clearly a negative impact within this quarter, um, represent um, very strong progress in the objective that we have. Um, the management team um, there um, has been moving very concertedly um, towards improving that, that base, and I continue to work with them to evaluate what that broader opportunity is and what the sustainable growth rate um, for profitability and value is um, for over the long term, as I do with the with the energy business. Um, so we're actively engaged in it. Um, I would just uh, ask for uh, everyone's uh, um, patience as um, we we work through that and evaluate the business as a whole, rather than focusing on the on the specific quarter quarter's results. Um, but that's what we've been doing. Very good. Thanks for the color. We have our next. Question comes from the line of Greg Peters from Raymond James. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, I was wondering if you could provide some updated views on the changing competitive dynamics uh, in the insurance space, uh, especially when we hear about uh, or hearing more about the success of these software companies like Duck Creek and Guidewire. It seems like these companies are selling you know, competitive ser or competing services. Um, you know, we hear them talking about their claims management platform, their underwriting platforms, their reinsurance capabilities. It seems to be gathering some momentum in the insurance vertical. So maybe, maybe you can provide you know uh, some color around market share for Veris versus these other companies, or how how you're working with these companies. Well, you want to take that one? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the question. Uh, I think what our customers are looking for, these are our insurance customers, they are looking for an interconnected ecosystem, a way to pull information, a way to pull and process uh, in a seamless way. So we are very tightly aligned with a Duck Creek and a Guidewire. You know, as an example, all of our ISO loss costing rules, meaning the, the way we codify uh, rates, uh, is inside of both Duck Creek and Guidewire. We pull, uh, customers able to pull underwriting information uh, from us through those two platforms. Uh, claims fraud, same thing. We are integrated in a way that we are you know, partners. So there is a way that we partner very effectively, but at the same time, you know, the world is heading towards analytics. So Duck Creek, Guidewire, as an example, are doing more analytics probably more focused on the individual insurer. Information as they process the claim, what's it looked like over the last quarter, uh, how, how the rates uh, looked for that insurer last quarter. Where we tend to focus is we have this aggregated view of the industry, so our analytics is more benchmark, it's relative to other peers, it's an industry view. Let me also remind you that 
as we think about software, we're becoming more software intense. So SQL software uh, has been moving into the United States, becoming certainly more a global player uh, beyond the London market. So I think there is some more overlap with the two, but we continue to work together to satisfy customers. Um, so hopefully that, that's responsive to the software play. Uh, and I'll just highlight, you know, because of the nature of our industry standard program, you know, we're integrated with almost every policy and vendor. You know, we are uh, kind of across the board. So we'll continue to do that to share our content uh, with uh, any insurer or the insurer that needs it. Got it. And and then my follow-up question would just be pivot back to um, some comments I think Lee made earlier regarding just, you know, sort of the long-term targets around organic revenue growth and then uh, EBITDA, you know, 7% and then EBITDA growing a little bit faster. I was wondering, you know, uh, if you have a similar viewpoint or the board has a similar viewpoint around free, free cash flow. Yeah. Um I, I, I don't see um, over the long term uh, a significant gap um, between the, um, the the EBITDA, the revenue and EBITDA um, growth rates, um, and the um, and our cash flow. You know, the, the two um, should be fairly um, fairly consistent. Um, obviously, there are a lot of variables that, from a timing standpoint, you know, may influence that. You know, but as kind of core um, core growth rates, uh, I don't see a, uh, a substantial difference there. Got it. Thanks for the answers. We have our next question comes from the line of Andrew Jeffrey from Trust Securities. Here, line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. Appreciate you taking the question. Uh, you know, as we see the. The, the greater digitization of insurance and, and more life cycle solutions. I, I wonder if Verisk sees an opportunity in payments, uh, you know, as far as supporting disbursements, uh, you know, from the from the carriers to the insured. So thank you for the question, and, and thank you for the look forward. Uh, we have recently introduced Verisk Pay. Uh, and we do believe that in this kind of world of interconnectivity and automation, uh, electronic payments are going to factor into that. Uh, the place where we started uh, was places where we thought we could most, night, most neatly integrate uh, into our solution. So think of our exact word solution, which is rep representative of repair cost estimates and payment of property damage, uh, and also in the, the world of real estate where we, we do some similar work uh, and we feel that those uh, electronic payments could facilitate things for our customers. We're working with uh, a big partner, Pfizer, and uh, we hope to extend the use cases beyond planes and into some premium and other places like segregation where we think that uh, our insurance customers uh, would benefit. Great. I uh, look forward to learning more. We have our next question comes from the line of Jeff Mueller from Baird. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to ask about insurance, and I know the growth rate's kind of in the typical pretty tight range, but it decelerated. So I heard a call out on cap bond issuance. I think I also heard something about some end market consolidation. To me, the cap bond issuance is just more naturally variable quarter to quarter, the consolidation would be something that would take longer to recover from. So just any uh, any help parsing out between those factors. And then on the growth driver side, is ISO pricing this calendar year similar to prior calendar years? And I heard you on uh, Pipeline, Scott, um, I guess how's pipeline conversion and, and bookings, especially for those strategically important platformed uh, analytic environments and, and analytic objects. Yeah, so maybe I can start at the top, but Mark, you should come in real quick on, on um, especially the first part of Jeff's question. Thanks for the questions, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I, the uh, you know most of the most of the selling effort um, goes where we have the priority, uh, and the priority is on these, uh, and just as you said, just the uh, platform the analytic environments, the analytic objects. So that is the majority of the pipeline. And so all those comments about uh, contract length stretching out and the, and the depth of the, the pipeline, that applies fully 
to that part of the product suite. So there's there's no real differentiation there. Um, when you look quarter, when you look year over year on cap bond issuance, Q120 was a strong quarter. Q121 was a less strong quarter. We pay a lot of attention to that. Cap bond issuance has picked up uh, since the first quarter. Um, so we don't see anything different in the environment. It was just really kind of moment in time. Mark, anything you want to add to that? I think the only thing I'll, I'll go to is some of our uh, traditional uh, ISO uh, information. And uh, that uh, is, is, again, you know, rock solid with customers. Uh, if you were to look at the way we um, kind of think about it, just remember, we're, we're, think, we're taking a long-term view. We would uh, prefer to gather new uh, sales from new solutions uh, from customers uh, as opposed to kind of have artificially high price increases. So I think we remain pretty modest and kind of have a little handled pricing for ISO. Uh, and uh, you are correct, we did highlight uh, some industry consolidation, which uh, doesn't necessarily, you know, one plus one doesn't equal one. But sometimes people like, you know, about 1.8 in the way some of our, our pricing algorithms work. So that was a bit of a, a headwind uh, for the year. Yes. And no change to the pricing algorithm itself yeah. in 2021. Thank you. Got it. And then a question on the expense management approach in financial services. It, it seems like revenue is kind of rebasing lower for a period of time, and I think you said the Q2 profitability should be similar to Q1, which was fairly depressed, I guess, in my eyes. So uh, are you taking expenses out of the the business, or does it need to start growing again um, to start getting margins back up? Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, um, certainly understand the, understand the questions. Um, so, you know, on the um, – on the revenue um, front, um, we uh, naturally have that impact of the contract um, transitions. You know, a part of that uh, are, um, are are contracts um, that um, are, are not there going forward. Um, but as I indicated, there also is a, a component um, where um, revenue has shifted into future periods. So it's not a uh, I wouldn't describe it as a, a complete um, you know rebasing or elimination of that. Um, but the other factor are some of the COVID-sensitive revenues um, that um, we um, have seen the impact. We've talked about bankruptcy. We've talked about spend-informed analytics. We're actually seeing um, some stronger improvement on the spend-informed analytics as things open up. Um, so um, hopefully if that continues, we'll see um, strength in that, um, in that regard. Um, and, um, and, and, of course, we're also watching the bankruptcy very carefully and then the overall performance of the banks, um, which are, are doing well, and hopefully that translates into greater opportunities on the, on the analytics and the consulting front. Um, on the expense front, um, yes, in, in the quarter we had probably a heavier uh, load of expense um, than uh, we typically have, and so um, you're looking ahead, um, we um, would anticipate in not as heavy uh, an expense impact, um, and we are looking uh, at um, making adjustments um, from, a, um, um, from an expense management standpoint um, that will um, help us um, uh, avoid or, or, or offset the margin impact that we experienced uh, in, the, in the first quarter. Got it. Thank you all. We have our next question comes in the line of Andrew Simon from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Lee, two questions. Uh, beyond the cap bond volatility and industry consolidation that you just recently mentioned, could you list any other drivers of why Veris organic revenue growth on its non-COVID business, that's the 85% of revenues, decelerated to 4.9% in the first quarter versus 65 uh, in, in, the, in the fourth quarter? And let me just kind of put out my, my other question, too. Uh, it's the question about 21 EBITDA margins. Uh, Lee, in the last two quarters, you mentioned a comment about 21 EBITDA margins uh, relative to 20 and 19. Just could you um, uh, update your comments, and is there any uh, year uh, that the margins are likely to be uh, closer to this year? Yeah, and, and thank you, Andrew. Um, and I, I just want to clarify, but, um, y you were addressing the question um, um, uh, both uh, at a consolidated level. Yeah. Is, that, consolidated. is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I think we did describe the, you know, the primary impacts, as, you, as you've indicated, in terms of the, um, 
uh, of the catastrophe bond um, uh, impact and some of the consolidation impacts. You know, naturally, you can look at the other the performance of the other business units um, from a revenue standpoint. Um, you know, in financial services. You know, in particular with the contract transitions and the COVID sensitive. Uh, I think from an energy and specialized markets, it was kind of a you know relatively uh, relatively um, flat uh, flat quarter. Um, so uh, I, I, I would I would probably just point out that you know financial services you know, um, clearly had a, a contribution to the overall um, the overall growth rate um, in that um, in that regard. Um, and uh, as um, you know, to your question on margin, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back to. Um, the way I, uh, I, I answered a previous question, which, which was um, that clearly we saw the margin benefit um, in 2020 um, resulting from um, our, the reduction of expenses um, to a greater degree than the, than the decline in revenues. And looking ahead to 2021, where we will uh, be coming out of this, we are expecting um, some revenue growth improvement but that probably um, will be exceeded by the normalization of expenses. Um, however, if you think about the, um, the responsiveness or the growth rates of those two lines, um, we are expecting that the, the, um, you know, the rate of recovery from an expense standpoint um, will be slower, meaning that we um, will um, hope to hold on um, to some of that margin benefit that we experienced in 2020, um, but not all of it. Um, so, you know, that um, um, is, I think, the outcome of our, our expectations at this point, um, kind of looking, kind of reiterating, you know, that we are expecting that our margins still um, will be above where they were pre-pandemic, um, but will probably uh, um, come down as, uh, as those, as the expenses normalize. Okay. Thank you. We have our next question comes from the line of, Hamza Mazari from Jeffries. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Good, good morning. Uh, my, my question is uh, around um, uh, the, the in, international business within, within insurance. Um, you know, I think a couple of years ago you guys had flagged that you expected that business, I guess it was growing high single digits, and you expected it to double organically in five years. I, I think that was a couple of analyst days ago. And, and, and maybe, you know, I think you guys had flagged UK, Ireland, Canada, Germany, France, India, Southeast Asia as future growth. So maybe just update us. How, how big is international today as part of the total offering and insurance? And then w which countries are you sort of under versus over-penetrated, and where, where's the opportunity? Uh, thank you for the question, Mrs. Mark. So um, uh, let me kind of give you a quick summary. So first of all, uh, good recollection of uh, the overview that we provided. Uh, if I was to now grade ourselves on, on where we are at that, I would say from a U.K. perspective in Ireland, uh, we are well ahead of that plan. I think we are doing extremely well, uh, and I think we've highlighted some of the benefits of uh, the SQL acquisition and, and just the progress that's been made there, along with some of the work that we've done on the claims and, and underwriting front. Uh, as we think about other regions, uh, we did highlight, you know, France and Germany, and uh, I would say there it's been a tougher sledding. Um, we were looking for a combination of organic access uh, as well as uh, movement into maybe some businesses that provided services there, I think, you know, from an M&A perspective. Uh, I think we've done well from a, a cat bond perspective, cat modeling perspective. So uh, there, strong way, uh, just probably less uh, progress um, with some of the other underwriting and claims in that, that France and Germany field. Uh, I think we kind of had talked about Asia Pacific as, as more long term. I'm not sure I could comment on that, that's probably still on the, uh, on the horizon. So thank you for the question. Uh, I think we give ourselves overall strong grades. Great, great, great. And just my, my follow-up question, and, and you touched on it, uh, Lee, a little bit on on the time frame in, in evaluating um, you know, the, the non-insurance segments, but, but, but do you sort of have any high-level color of that financial service business has changed structurally? Uh, I know a while back, uh, and Lee, I know you, you weren't there at the time, but, but, uh, uh, but, but the healthcare business had structurally changed. 
and and uh, you know the government had gotten more involved. The business wasn't as global, uh, you know, and there were some other items. As you look at this business with new competition or or other stuff, maybe you know diversifying away from banking customers has been slower. Do, do you have a sense of you know? Time frame wise, is that sort of um, you're still looking into that, or do you guys have a pretty good view there already? Um, so, Hans, I, I think uh, thank you for the question, um, and I, and I think there are there's an external perspective and a and an internal perspective. If you, if you're asking about uh, you know the structural, you know, has the business changed structurally? Um, and I, I I think your primary question is from an external standpoint, and I would say that. The the presence of other players that serve that banking the banking industry, particularly as it relates to cards, you know, it remains has remained um, relatively um, consistent. The the large players, whether they're the credit bureaus or the um, uh, um, or the the, the um, network um, companies, um, are there. Um, they serve that that industry and. Um, the Ferris Financial Services um, entity um, has for a long time competed very successfully within that environment uh, given the very unique nature of the data set and the unique relationships that they have um, with the industry. And they provide a, a service um, by integrating that, that data set and delivering it in, in a way that, that others um, aren't able to do. And so I don't, um, I don't believe that there has been a, a material change, but we're, we are mindful of the competitive um, environment that they operate in. Um, from a, uh, the other perspective, from a structural change, I can say unequivocally um, that we have um, changed uh, and improved the business in shifting it to more of a sustainable focus on growth within the, in the business um, with the steps that the management team has, has made. You know, some of those have had um, obviously a, a, um, a, a challenging financial impact in the short term, but we believe that the business is better positioned for the long term given those structural changes. So I wanted to address both parts of those questions. That's great. Very helpful. Thank you. We have our next question comes from the line of Gary Bisbee from Bank of America. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to go back to some earlier commentary on, on the energy business. Scott, I think you said you know, you just need sort of a normal market environment, and not necessarily a robust one, to deliver uh, to, to to your goals in the business. I guess I, I wanted to ask, what is it you would expect to deliver in in a normal environment? In, in the five years you've gone the business, it's grown seven percent once, and and not grown a couple of those years. And so, it's just not clear to me that this business is positioned, particularly given the volatility inherent in the end market to deliver to the long-term revenue growth targets you've set for the company and, and you know, on, on a number of occasions actually said this business should outperform those over the long term or grow faster than some of your other assets. So what is it you're planning for in a normal energy market if we're moving back into that today? Thank you. Yeah, you bet, Gary. Thank you for the question. Yeah, you know, we, when you said, and, and I actually related to the way that, um, uh, Lee was responding to that prior question about financial services. So, you know, if you kind of get to the top of, of sort of our business and that ecosystem, what you're looking at is um, uh, global customers that are large, that are facing uh, uh, challenging issues in terms of how they're going to run their businesses in the future are calling increasingly upon data analytics to try to help them make these, these very, very important decisions um, and have only a few places that they can turn to outside of their own four walls in order to find support with respect to the kind of data analytics that they want to make the commercial decisions that they need to make. And then I would add to that one other point, which is um, the range of topics in the ecosystem that, that that can be covered, and those have really expanded in light of the energy transition. And um, there was an earlier question about what do we do with respect to renewables, but I, I would point out also that in the, uh, in the in the energy space, there is a there is a great sensitivity uh, to topics of climate change, and so um, our ability to also observe on things like emissions um, is is an important capability and a distinct capability. 
And so the summation of all of that for me, Gary, would be that um, it, you're, you're right about the track record. I would point out, in, in, over the course of the last five years, there have been two relatively unprecedented uh, shocks to the, to the pricing of the commodity. And I'm not here to predict that there can't be any more of those, but they were pretty unusual and in a, and in a relatively you know, compressed period of time. Against that, I would put a very large global market with increasing appetite for data analytics of the kind that we provide. And so, you know, my, my summary on all of that would be that um, I look for this business to, uh, to contribute uh, at or above the, the, uh, the targets we have as, 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 a, uh, as a company overall. You know, we're going to hold it to that standard. Uh, so that's really it. Yeah, and, and then just one quick follow-up for Lee. That, that a couple of years ago, you you had uh, the company had discussed sort of a glide path lower in capital intensity. Now, of course, I think that was in large part on the Geomni business at the time. Um, you know, and and since then, you've you've stepped up technology investment considerably. I guess I'm just wondering for if you could level set for us today. How are you thinking about capital intensity over the next few years as, as you get through more of the cloud? Projects should we is the goal still that that moderates a couple of points lower over time or, or where where are you at now? Thank you. Yeah, you know, no, thank you, Gary. Um, and, and so the short answer is is yes, and it and it is a function as you've described um, of our of our migration to the to the cloud, um, which is reducing um, the level of capex that we would have typically spent um, on hardware and infrastructure. Now, you know, offsetting that. Um, but we, we still think it's not completely offsetting that, that benefit, um, is an increasing level of internal software development intensity, um, which is a, a function of some of the trends that Mark was talking about in terms of um, utilizing software um, opportunity as a way to activate and deliver um, our data sets and provide um, solutions for our clients. And so, you know, that is uh, clearly an element that we think is added to our business. It's generating good returns. Um, we never want um, the CapEx intensity metric um, to, um, uh, uh, to obscure our fundamental return objectives. Um, so uh, we do expect uh, to, con uh, to see that improvement over time. You know, it has probably been obscured by some of the real estate um, renovations that we have done recently that are included in, in that. Um, but we are realizing um, real benefits in terms of reduc redux re reductions in CapEx um, and even OpEx and expenses related to infrastructure as a result of that. And some of those are um, being reinvested in uh, some of the software development elements uh, as we develop that component of, our, of the delivery of our data sets. Thank you. And there are no further questions. I'll turn by the call over to you, Stacey. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Uh, appreciate all the, uh, the questions and the dialogue, and we will certainly, as always, be following up with many of you um, following this call. So thank you for the continued uh, interest and support. We'll speak with you soon. Bye for today. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you all for participating, and you may now disconnect. Have a great day.